أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء أما بعد يقول الله في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقال الملك اتوني به فلما جاءه الرسول قال ارجع إلى ربك فاسأله ما بال النسوة التي قطعن أيديهن صدق الله العلي العظيم إن شاء الله utilizing this particular verse which is ayah 50 from chapter 12 of the Holy Quran Surah Yusuf it sheds a light on a very important aspect whereby as followers of Ahlul Bayt for the last three nights we've talked about issues regarding aspects whereby we are questioned on all fronts to do with our faith, our understanding, the fundamentals within religion, and we need to have a way in which to defend ourselves. This particular verse in question from Surah Yusuf highlights a particular point whereby after Yusuf has assisted the king of the time, he says, all of a sudden I need this Yusuf services. But Yusuf stops there and then stating to us that I will not come for service unless you find out a particular truth that has been hidden, which is an issue regarding ladies that cut their hands, as Yusuf says. I will not come unless you ask about the issue regarding the woman that cut their hands. Now, why is it so significant when it comes to the story of Yusuf and what we are right now commemorating. Because what we understand in our traditions, when it comes towards Yusuf and the comparison that he has, we find within our traditions there's always, always a comparison between the ghaybah of Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman and the ghaybah of the Prophet of Allah, Yusuf. Now when we have these comparisons, there are many things to be learnt. Amongst them, as an example, that Yusuf was present in the community, but people did not know who he was. And he was able to establish his government, able to teach the people around him, able to take them from darkness towards light. And the Imams say, make sure that you understand the story of Yusuf. And the Quran refers to the story as being the best of stories within the Holy Quran. Because there are so many examples to take when it comes to the time that we're living in which is awaiting our ghaib amongst these is the one that we refer to stating that in order for the ghaib to become apparent and come towards us and come to the assistance he refers to an issue that there are particular aspects that are hidden that are veiled that need to come to light once they come to light it may be a contributing factor of the Imam Sahib al Asr wa Zaman returning. Now, amongst these, when you look at the scholars' works, they say the, of the fundamental issues that are always hidden in fear that it may cause tension towards anyone that hears it is the issue of Fatima al Zahra. And that's another added layer of oppression for Fatima al Zahra, alayhi afdal as salati wa salam, whereby. When we come towards the issue, you'll find throughout the world, not just in the West, throughout the world, you'll find people will not tolerate, for example, personalities being mentioned by name. And we understand that it may cause tension if you were to refer to them in a certain manner. If I was to bring forward names and I would, for example, curse, it would cause tension. 
But when we look at these particular perspectives, we need to understand if we approach every issue Islamically, academically, and bring forward references, then the issue is there. You can take those references and build upon what you know. Either you choose to go by what the references say and begin to question yourself, question your belief, question what you should believe in, or you may look at the references and say, this may be too hard for me to comprehend, that this even occurred within history. You don't know what's going to happen when you read these references. As an example, there's a story that highlighted, and I believe it was Alam al-Amini, when he went to study to find particular works that shed a light upon the Khilaf and the perspective of the Khilaf of Amir al muminin and indeed the incident of Ghadir. In his research, he went to different places. Amongst these places, he went into studying under people which were not from the Ahl al-Bayt school of thought. And then you'll find amongst his teachers would look at him, not knowing that he's from the followers of Ahl al-Bayt, and they'd ask him every time, they'd ask him, for example, do you have anything else from these Rafada, as they used to call us? These are Rawafad, is there anything funny that you've heard from them? Anything new you want to tell us? So the Alam is saying, you know, I told him this just to see what he reacts. So he says, these Rafada, they say that in Sahih al Bukhari, there's a particular hadith that says, Whomever angers Fatima angers me. Whomever angers me angers Allah. He goes, okay. So what's the funny part? He goes, no. They say, after four or five pages, it says that Fatima died angry with the personality by the name of Abu Bakr. Is that in the Bukhari? He says, yeah, that's, but that's, that's what the Shia say. How many pages? Four or five. So he goes, comes the next day laughing. So Alam al-Amini is looking at him, he's like, what's so funny? He says, so I told you they're lying. He goes, why, why are they lying? He goes, nah, you said four or five pages. He goes, well, I found it ten pages in. As our argument is in the fact of how many pages is between Fatima was angry and that she was angry with Abu Bakr when she passed away. Is it the pages difference that we're... The issue is what? That if we were to hold on to this great lady, knowing her status in the eyes of Rasulullah and indeed the eyes of Allah, the tension is the fact that either I choose one side, which is Fatima, or I choose the other. There's all of a sudden no more middle grounds, is there? If you are shedding a light on the events that occurred to Fatima al-Zahra and indeed her death and the question that regards the whereabouts of her grave. So understanding this, you'll begin to find there's a lot of tension with anything to do with Fatima al-Zahra. Take that into perspective. Moving into it, you'll find different attacks come forward with the issue of Fatima. Amongst these is an issue that they come forward and say that, you know, your Shia, even your Quran is different. In the understanding that they believe we have a Quran by the name of Mus'haf Fatima. How many of us have heard this? There's an issue which is called Mus'haf Fatima and they believe that that is the Quran of the Shia. And you'll find many of Shia themselves, it's funny enough, that they may have not even heard about something called Mus'haf Fatima altogether. But supposedly we don't have a Quran, we have something called Mus'haf Fatima. Now, tonight's argument will be what is Mus'haf Fatima on the first level? And when establishing the contents of this particular book, is it a Quran, isn't it a Quran? Within this book, what is there? When we've established that, then we want to find, through looking at the perspectives that are in this book, can we prove each and every perspective within this book has a Quranic background, can we prove each and every aspect in the book of Fatima al-Zahra from a Quranic perspective or can't we? Because we need to be of the people that have a reply to every question. If we're a school of thought that doesn't have a reply to a question, it becomes very shaky, doesn't it? It becomes a school of thought that says don't ask questions. Whereas a school of thought of Ahl al-Bayt says no, ask. Because by Allah, there is an answer for every single question that you may have within history, within your personal life, within every single aspect of existence and indeed even afterwards. 
There's an answer. Don't be afraid to ask. So inshallah, we can delve into this to see at the ending notion, to end the four nights of remembering Fatima, what position she has in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we can inshallah start the majlis by blessing the hudur with three of your loudest salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So what is Mus'haf Fatima? Now there's a, you know, you can go on for two, three nights just speaking about the beauty of this particular Mus'haf. But within the time limit, I just need to mention what it is, when it was brought forward, who revealed it, who accepted it, who wrote it down, and its contents. In order for us to prove it from the Holy Quran, that it has a basis. Mus'haf Fatima. Long story short, after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, you'll find Fatima al-Zahra is mourning. And they would come towards Amir al-Mu'mineen, Oh Ali, Fatima is mourning over Rasulullah day and night. That we hear her crying at every moment of the day. Look at the words of the people that lived at the time of Imam Ali. They say that the voice of Fatima has disturbed us. The voice, the, the wailing, the crying has disturbed us. Ali, either you tell her that she cries in the morning or the night. That period where Fatima al-Zahra has just lost the greatest creation, which also is her father, she's in a state of mourning. They would say that this particular period, the short period that she lived after the death of Rasulullah, that Jibra'il would come towards Fatima al-Zahra and try to console her through these tragic times. And when he would come down consoling her, you'll find that he would bring forward things that he would give her information in which she took from Jibra'il and narrated to Amir al muminin So Mus'haf Fatima is all of a sudden what? Something that Jibreel bought, brings towards Fatima to Zahra. Fatima narrates it to who? Amir al muminin Amir al muminin would write it down. One tradition. Another tradition comes forward and says, no, Jibreel brings the whole book and gives it towards Fatima to Zahra. Now, Someone may ask a question, then what's within this book, which is known as Mus'haf Fatima? Imam Sadiq says that the contents of the book is that it does not have one ayah from the Holy Quran. So everyone comes forward and says that Mus'haf Fatima is the Quran, you reply by this. Imam Sadiq, what does he say? Doesn't contain one ayah from the Holy Quran. Then what does it contain? Mus'haf Fatima. He would say, Fihi ma kan. History, what was, and the correct history. And what will occur in the future. And that's why when we find incidents that occur, people that are displaced, kings that come and rise, and kings that fall, they'll come towards Ahlul Bayt. And Ahlul Bayt will reply, say, yes, I have read as such in the Mus'haf of my mother, Fatima al-Zahra. So now we've understood the content. When it was given to Fatima al Zahra, who wrote it down, and what kind of knowledge it has. Now, understanding this, when other schools of thought come forward and they say, well, hold on, we have particular question marks. What's the question marks? Number one, how can you say that someone has knowledge of the future events? Doesn't make sense to us and someone has knowledge of future events. Is there a Quranic background, number one? Number two, how can you say that if a person is not a prophet, that there may be an angel that communicates with them? Does it have a Quranic basis or doesn't it? Number three, understanding the aspect of knowledge being given. Understanding 
the aspect of angels and standing now how can a person not just have knowledge but foresee events that will occur in the future is there any basis to reply by saying when you go towards the holy quran you go towards chapter 18 surah al-kahf it narrates a story between a prophet of allah and what Allah refers to as Abdun min Abidina. What does he refer to? One of our many servants. The story goes as follows. Musa is thinking to himself, you know, am I the most knowledgeable? One of the five greatest, isn't he? So Allah says, no, there's someone. I have more knowledge than you. He says, lead me to him. Long story. He arrives at a person by the name of, in traditions, Either khidr or khudr. This person goes on a journey. The first thing he does is tells Musa, listen, with your knowledge, you're not going to understand what I'm about to perform. So don't ask questions. Have patience. So you'll find he takes him. First, he kills a, a young boy. Asks questions. He says, didn't I tell you you didn't have patience? He says, I'm sorry. Second, there was a boat. Absolutely fine. Puts a hole in it. So what are you doing? Told you be patient. And thirdly, they go towards a particular village. They ask food from the people. And the people say, no, sorry. But there was a wall that was falling. All of a sudden, he takes it down and rebuilds it. Musa's like, why don't you ask for money? He says, I told you. Be patient with me. Don't ask questions until I tell you. But now that three occurrences, you did not have the patience to understand what's occurring I will tell you what happened and then we'll go out separate ways. Here, the line is, I don't want to go into too much detail, but the aspect here that a man, which in traditions, isn't a prophet. As Allah, what does he refer to him? Khidr is what? Abdun. Some say he's a very righteous man of the people that will return back with Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman that he's granted longevity in his life. You'll find this particular personality says to Musa, you do not have knowledge of that which Allah has bestowed on me. Was he a prophet? No. So there's a Quranic basis for someone to have more knowledge even than a prophet. Number one. I was interesting to this particular point when someone comes towards Imam Sadiq. They ask him, oh Imam, who has more knowledge than Khadr and Musa? And Imam Asad, what does he reply? He says, لَوْ كُنْتُ بَيْنَهُمَا لَعَلَّمْتُهُمَا Meaning what? Had I been at the time of Khadr and Musa, I would have taught for my knowledge both of them. Now let's go yesterday. What did we say? We said, we're the hujja of Allah on creation. Not Muslims, not Mu'mins. We are the hujja of Allah, being the imams on creation. And Fatima is the hujja on us. So all of a sudden when we look at knowledge, when you see Imam al-Sadiq, and he says the hujja on me is Fatima, and Imam al-Sadiq is able to teach both Musa and Khidr, then what would Fatima al-Zahra be able to teach? Had she been there? Question mark. Number one. So anyone comes forward and says, well, how can a lady have knowledge there's a reply from the holy quran number two how can an angel come towards a personality that's not a prophet because you know you look at the the holy quran they say all of this is not a physical angel that comes forward that allah inspires in different means people or animals or insects to perform their duties or to perform that which Allah wants them to perform. But is there an instance where there was a prophet, sorry, that there wasn't a prophet and then there's an angel that came into close contact? And we look at chapter of the Holy Quran by Surah Maryam. Chapter 19 of the Holy Quran. You'll find very clearly, verse 17, it says, that Jibra'il comes down and speaks towards Maryam. Now Maryam, great lady, mother of Isa. 
Now, if you want to compare aspects, Maryam alayhi salam, one of the four greatest ladies, Rasulullah, what does he say? He says, many men throughout history have reached an aspect of completion and perfection. But there's only four ladies that have attained this level. The first of which being who? Asiya, Maryam, Khadija, and Fatima to Zahra. And the greatest lady amongst them, what does Rasulullah say? Is Fatima. Why? Sayyidat Nisa al Alam or Alameen? Alameen. The greatest lady. Now, if Maryam, you find Jibrail coming to Maryam, speaking to Maryam within the Holy Quran, very clear, precise. Then why do you think that the daughter of the greatest creation of mankind won't be able to see an angel? Another question mark. Quran proved. And that's why when we go towards a hadith that we have, many of us may overlook them. When we go to a hadith known as the hadith of the cloak, hadith al kisa when we read it, the first lines, what do we say? Who narrates it? And Jabir ibn Abdullah al Ansari. And let me hear it. Fatima. What is Fatima saying? She says, I saw my sons come. I saw Ali come. I saw Rasulullah. Then she says, What? She says, Jibrail came. And ask permission from us to enter under the cloak. Doesn't she? And what the interesting part is when you read Hadith Al-Kisa. Before Jibrail comes. Look at this point. Before Jibrail comes and asks permission. Fatima narrates what happened in dialogue between Allah and the angels. You have to figure that one out. She's narrating what happened between Allah and the angels before Jibra'il came to tell us, oh, by the way, this happened. Fatima's already narrated it. Fatima. And the interesting thing is, you know, like, subhanAllah, so I don't get too much into detail of topic, but let's say we put a different personality instead of Fatima that is revered in other schools of thought, they wouldn't have a problem that Jibra'il met with them. No problem. Of course. She's the daughter of Fulan. Of course, the Jibra'il. Why not? Fatima problem. That's why anything to do with Ahlul Bayt, if they can find an, an aspect to bring down, they will. You know, like, when we go towards particular perspectives, we said yesterday, if there wasn't a hujja on earth, lasakhat al-ard, perished, then the question mark remains where? Is between Isa and Rasulullah with 600 odd years. During that time, Isa is not on the earth, he's in the heavens. Those 600 plus years, who was the hujjah on earth? Rasulullah wasn't born. Nah, but Abu Talib died the kafir. That's what they say. Go look at who brought Rasulullah up, raised him, took him. Then you'll understand. But no, he's the father of Ali, so we need to bring him down. We don't have anything else to bring down Ali ibn Abi Talib, so let's go around. Fatima sees Jibra'il. So there's no question mark there. Now, all of a sudden, how can she tell the future? Isn't that the question? How can we understand that Fatima al-Zahra is able to foresee the future? We understand through the Quran, she can have knowledge that Allah bestows. We understand through the Quran, if she's greater than Maryam, Maryam met Jibra'il, then without a doubt, she's been able to as well. But how can she see in the future how can we understand that Mus'haf Fatima has events that are yet or is yet to occur you go towards the traditions that we have very clear traditions what do they say Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen is the door to the Medina of knowledge which is Rasulullah he says very clearly Rasulullah has taught me 1000 doors of knowledge from every door opens another thousand. Thousand times thousand, you can have the calculations there. Million doors of knowledge is not something easy. When Amir al-Mu'min would say this, 
Amir al muminin so leave aside everything else. Amir al muminin of his students, these people may be looked at to be not even close towards being the dust under their feet. When these companions come forward, and we have people that come forward and say that they refer to a personality like Rushaid al-Hajari, for example. If anyone's read the biography of Rushaid al-Hajari, he has another name by the name of Rushaid al-Manaya wal balaya Rushaid, Amir al muminin taught him from his knowledge a little. From. What knowledge did he teach him? Someone asked Rushaid, very well known, that you tell him, this person, how will he die? Rushaid will tell you, this is how this person will die. And it was known that Amir al taught him, and therefore he saw everyone's death. And so when you find two people in the tradition that is mentioned by Sheikh Abbas al Qummi that they came together, one personality is a person by the name of Maytham al Tamar and Habib ibn Mudahir. When they come together, they've come, the people around them begin to say that we heard them speaking to one another. When they spoke, they, they were on their horses. Maytham al Tamar comes. Habib ibn Mudahar, they would say even till their horses got stuck in each other's necks. That's how close they were. You'll find that Habib ibn Mudahar looks towards Maytham al Tamar. He would say, it's as if I see, in the traditions, a bold man with a large belly going to defend the household of Rasulullah and he is punished for it and he will be hung and he will, his stomach will be punctured in the gallows themselves. Who says this? Habib al -Mubar. On the other side we say, Betham al Tamar says, as if I see a person red faced with two tresses that will go out in defense of the grandson of Rasulullah and his head will return towards Kufa. So the people around are saying, look at these guys. I've never heard people lying so much in our life. As they left, you know who comes all of a sudden? Rushaid al-Hajari. Now everyone knew Rushaid. They knew. You ask him, he knows. So they're like, Rushaid, we know that your qualities are undisputed. We heard these two personalities say A and B. Can you shed a light? Look what Rashid says. Rashid says, by Allah, Maytham forgot to mention one thing. They say, what did he forget to mention? He says, he forgot to mention that the horse rider that carries the head of Habib ibn Mudahir will be given an extra hundred coins. You know why? It's because he had long hair and they tied the hair of Habib towards the horse. And so every time the horse would run or gallop or walk, the head of Habib would be hit by the knees of the horse. Who says this? Roshan. He says the person that will bring the head of Habib will give an extra hundred coins. They said, we heard that. We thought to ourselves, no. Days and nights go past exactly as they were given. You know what Roshan says? He comes towards Abaydullah ibn Ziyad. He says, what did Imam Ali teach you about how you will die? He says, Amir al-Mumin told me that you will be the one that will kill me. He says, how will I kill you? He says, Amir al muminin told me that you will cut my hands, my legs, and cut my tongue. So he says, I'm going to make a liar out of Ali. He says, how? He says, I'm going to cut your hands, cut your legs, I'm going to keep your tongue. So they say they cut the hands, they cut the feet of Rushaid al-Hajari. Look at this moment. His daughter was carrying his limbs while they carried him out. She looks at him and says, Abata, you know, how amazing is your ishtihad? Look at the reply of Rashid to his daughter to showcase to her, you know, like where we are. Because he's talking to us right here, right now. He says there will be people at the end of time. Unasun fi akhir zaman. بصائرهم في دينهم أشد من اجتهادنا. That your outlook within your religion is harder than that which we are performing jihad in now. And he has his hands and feet cut. 
Look how hard it is. When we say traditions such as a person that wants to hold on to his faith at the end of time is like holding on to a coal. This is what we mean. And you'll find Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad after Rashid keeps saying the merits of Amir al-Mu'mineen would end up cutting his tongue. This perspective is to showcase what? If a normal person has knowledge of the future because Amir al taught him glimpse of his knowledge. What knowledge does Fatima have? That if we were to say that this Mus'haf of Fatima has knowledge of what will occur, all of a sudden that wasiyah towards Sayyida Zainab has a valid aspect, doesn't it? When she says, go and smell the neck, embrace the chest. Because she knew. When we look into history and she looks towards Imam al Hussein. When she embraces Hussein, do you think she doesn't know what's going to happen in Karbala or doesn't she? When she looks at Imam al Hassan, does she know how he will be poisoned or not? When she looks towards Amir al Mu'mineen, because of that Mus'haf, do you not think she knew who will strike him while he's in prostration or not? And taking that into perspective as well, without a shadow of doubt, she would know exactly how she would be martyred. When she would know that it is necessity for her to go towards the door to protect the religion. And that's how Allah bestowed upon her to return back to him. She goes towards the door, doesn't she? She goes towards the door. Knowingly. What do we read? The ziyarah of Sayyidah Fatima all of a sudden has a different perspective. What's the first lines of the ziyarah of Sayyidah Fatima? Who can tell me? Ya mumtahana. I've tested you before I created you. And then what happens? And I found. For I have tested you for sabr. I have found you to be what? To be patient for what I put in front of you. So with all her knowledge, with everything that she knew that will befall her, befall her family, she was prepared for the sacrifice. You know what's interesting there? Like look at this aspect of sabr and Ahl al-Bayt. goes hand in hand. You know, in Ziyarat Nahi al-Muqaddasa, there's a particular line. You know what it says? Imam Sahib al-Asri was zaman is talking about Imam Hussein alayhi salam. You know what he says? He says, Ajibat min sabrika malaikatu sama. That the angels could not comprehend the level of your patience, O Hussein. Now I ask you, these angels that couldn't comprehend, did they not see every single one of the 124,000 prophets beforehand or didn't they? They saw. But the patience of Imam Hussein was something else. Now I take you to a few years afterwards or the next year that, that occurred. After Karbala, you'll find a personality by the name of Imam Sajjad goes on to the, as he refers to the wooden aspects which they made a pulpit out of in the courtroom of Yazid. What does he say? The famous lines. What does he say? أُعْطِيْنَا سِتٌ وَفُضِّلْنَا بِسَبْعٍ أُعْطِيْنَا الْعَلْمَ وَالْحِلْمَ وَالسَّمَاحَةَ وَالْفَصَاحَةَ وَالشَّجَاعَةَ وَالْمَحَبَّةَ فِي قُلُوبِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَفُضِّلْنَا بِأَنَّ مِنَّا النَّبِيُّ الْمُخْتَارُ وَمِنَّا الصِّدِّيقُ وَمِنَّا الطَّيَّارُ وَمِنَّا أَسَدُ اللَّهُ وَأَسَدُ رَسُولِهُ وَمِنَّا سِبْطَ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ وَمِنَّا مَهْدِيُّهَا وَن اللَّهُمَّ صَلِّ عَلَى There's a moment that he's saying, I am the son of, the son of, referring to Amir al-Munin. Then he says a word. He says, Ana ibn Asbar al-Sabri. Who was that? Ali ibn Abi Talib. Angels one side, Ajubat. Min sabrika malaikatu sama. For Imam al-Husayn. Look what happens in Karbala that they couldn't comprehend. But Imam al-Sajjad, what does he say? He says, that patience, you think that was patience? Look towards my grandfather Ali. Asbar al-Sabirin. You know what happened? Amir al muin Asbar al-Sabirin. Look at the last moments that I leave you with tonight. Amir al-Mu'in Asbar al-Sabirin. There's a moment when he buries Fatima al-Zahra. You know what he says to Rasulullah? Qal, ya Rasulullah, an safiyatika sabri. 
What did Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib see? That everything else, his patience was there. What did he see with Fatima al-Zahra? That he would say, Qal, Ya Rasulullah, Ansafi. 